Shalom, and welcome to our show, The Crossover, a show aimed at bridging gaps between Jews and Christians. Today we have a very special guest on our show, Dr. Richard Booker, who is the author of many books, over 20 books, and he has re most recently written a book, Why Christians Should Support Israel. Actually, it's a pamphlet. We've already done a show on this book, just some of the points, and there's so many points that we chose to let you uh, have another show on it. I'm just going to read from the opening page here. Why should Christians respond to the Arab-Israeli conflict? What is our position? Before answering these questions, we must learn the truth about the conflict between Israel and her Arab neighbors. There are so many different voices claiming to speak the truth. Some speak from a hidden agenda, some raise voices of hate, while others are well-meaning, but uninformed. How can we know which ones to believe? Like all people of goodwill, Christians are deeply concerned about truth, justice, and compassion. They desire that people be given the opportunity to live with honor, dignity, freedom, and peace. We truly want to listen to every legitimate voice that shares these values. Are there biblical, historical, or moral voices to guide us? As a concerned Christian and citizen of our world, Dr. Booker spent 25 years listening, studying, and traveling to Israel in order to learn the truth about this conflict. The purpose of him writing this booklet is to share with us what he's learned. Here's Mitch and Dr. Booker. Dr. Booker, welcome back to the crossover. Glad to have you come with us again. And this is part two of uh, why Christians should support uh, Israel. And in the last segment, we talked about different voices, one of the scripture, Jesus and the apostles. We spoke historically. And we want to continue on now with some of the other voices. Uh, one, humanitarianism. We know historically speaking, there's been a lot in the uh, destruction of uh, anti-Semitism, I should say, of the Jew on, on the Jewish people with the pogroms, crusades, etc. What does that have to do with this topic right here, Christians supporting uh, Israel? Anyone who has a sense of justice and mercy grasps the reality that if all people groups but the Jewish people have their own country, why can't the Jewish people have their own country in the sense of justice and morality and humanitarianism and compassion? as they were scattered among all the nations, of course, both under Islamic rule and unfortunately under Christian rule, Jews have been severely persecuted. And when the state of Israel was born, approximately 800,000 Jewish people who lived in the surrounding Middle Eastern countries were forced from their homes, all of their possessions taken, and they became refugees living in squalor, refugee camps in the new formed state of Israel. And so here we see this brand new country assimilating 800,000 refugees from the surrounding Arab countries. Of course, they were never compensated for all of their losses, mm -hmm. yet uh, this little tiny struggling country assimilated these people, uh, made them productive members of the society, Yet on the other end, the Arab people have kept their quote-unquote refugees in refugee camps, using them as pawns, political pawns against the state of Israel. Why is it that all these millions and millions of dollars that Saudi Arabia and these other countries have poured into the Palestinian Authority, why is it do we still have refugee camps? And so we have a humanitarian uh, a moral obligation to the Jewish people because of the Holocaust and all of their persecution to enable them to live in a secure country of their own. You know, it's hard to understand how over historically speaking that uh, a Jewish rabbi with uh, 12 Jewish disciples can all of a sudden that whole organization could be turned around to an anti-Semitic uh, front at times is what we've seen in history. It's just uh, amazing. And you've covered it. There's so much to, to cover in that topic. Um, let's let's jump to current, more current times here. America. Whether you be a Christian, whether you be a Jew, whether you be black, white, it doesn't matter. You live in America. You're an American. What basis would America have to support Israel? Is there one? Should we be concerned, or hey, it's it's half a continent away, half, the other side of the world? What, what's the difference? You know, we've always had that attitude until September 11. And now half a continent away is on our own continent. 
the most important thing we need to understand as Americans is that Israel is the only s democracy in the Middle East and it shares our Judeo-Christian values. It's a country that allows for human rights, for freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. They protect the Christian holy sites and the holy sites of all religions in the land, whereas the Arab Islamic countries, all dictatorships, uh, they do not share any of our values uh, of the dignity of life, uh, hum the worth of human life, uh, freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of religion. Uh, Israel is the only state in that part of the world that shares our values. As such, they are the frontline defense against terrorism for America. Hmm. So, Israel surrounded, and we'll show a map here too, by so many Arab countries. And most of those are totalitarian or all of, them. all of them. Israel, this little slice, as our viewers will see on, on the map. In fact, you could even hold up the book there, Dr. Brooke. You've got the page. Yeah, we have a map right here of it. And uh, you have uh, a sea of Arab countries with uh, Israel as a little bitty island. And to help people get a perspective, Israel is about the size of the state of New Jersey in the United States where the Arab countries, if you take all of the continental uh, mainland of the United States and add 50% more land mass, that is the land mass that the Arab countries occupy versus New Jersey, yet somehow New Jersey is causing all the problems. So let's jump back here. You're saying if Israel fell, then terrorism probably would come to our side in a, in a stronger way than what we've seen. We may lose our rights. We take it for granted. We've never had a battle on our homeland until 9-11. So we take our freedom for granted, don't we? Our, our, our women's rights and religious rights and humanitarian rights. It's hard for us to even imagine not having that. Are you trying to say if Israel went down, that could, we could be next? Well, absolutely. I've taken tour groups to Israel for 20 years, and uh, the radical Islamic fundamentalist battle cry is today we fight the Saturday people and tomorrow the Sunday people. So Islam divides all nations into two camps, uh, the, the house of peace and the house of war. If you are a country that's submitted to the dictates of Islam, you're in the house of peace. They're not going to make war because they've already conquered you. If you're not, you're in the house of war. And so Islam's strategy of the radical fundamentalists is, of course, to establish the rule of Islam over all the nations, including the United States. So if you think about the, the women's liberation rights movement in America uh, going back to the 7th century, I don't think the American women would be very uh, fulfilled with that kind of life. Hmm. Uh, all of the freedoms that we take for granted and the American way of life with our freedoms, our, our human values, all of these are on the line in Israel's battle with terrorists. If the American government does not fully allow the Israeli government to defend itself against radical terrorism, then that will be a green light to the terrorists Absolutely. that America is not going to stand firm. They then can come freely to our shores, and of course Hamas cells are throughout the United States already, and we will not have an America as we know it. Absolutely. Well, what a balance. So you got, you've got the, you, the rights over here and freedom, and on this side of the scale is oil, which we have to get from the Arab nations. What a trick, right? Only God can pull this one off, I, I think is what it would come down to. But it, we have to defend ourselves or allow Israel to defend herself and hence defend ourselves too. Dr. Booker, let's go back to this big map here. We've got uh, big, the map on, on the Mideast. Absolutely. And here's the land. And geographically speaking, we have a country that is uh, the size of New Jersey you're, you're sharing with us. You've got 20 Arab League nations around it. You've got 600 times more land than what Israel has. And, uh, and you've, we've already covered the d democratic side of it. Um, w w so geographically speaking. <laughs> it's an absurd question to even ask. It really it? is, isn't it? <laughs> How is it, you know, with this huge mass of, of Arab countries that they can't be satisfied with all they have, this one little sliver? And again, the reason is because you have plopped right in their midst 
a country that represents Judeo-Christian values rather than Islam. You know, on the, on the side of morality, on the side of this land too, um, let, let, let's, let, let's go to the land from another, another view here, on the voice of the land. Um, right now, listen, the Palestinians, they, want, they deserve a place to live. They've got families they're raising, just like the Jewish people, and uh, they want a safe, secure place. Did Israel ever push them off the land? Did this, did, did, were the Palestinians removed ever? Was, did this ever take place in history? Absolutely not. But this is the... Why does the, the news <laughs> seem to tell us something else? Well, because they, they don't know their own history. They, they haven't studied. They just believe the propaganda line put out by the Arab people. But the Jewish people have had a continuing existence in the land for 3,000 years. Uh, from the early 1800s, Jerusalem itself had a majority Jewish population. In the late 1880s, uh, because of Russian pogroms, the Jewish people made massive Aliyah immigrations to what was then called Palestine, later Israel, and they began to develop the land of Palestine, pre-Israel pre Palestine, which was a barren wasteland at that time. It was a malaria-infested swamp in the north and an uninhabitable desert in the south. But the Bible says, interesting enough, that this land only prospers when the rightful owners are in it. And for centuries it sat there as a backwater. Wow. It was never any, any empire's capital. Jerusalem was never any, any empire's capital ever. There was never a sovereign state in the land from the time the Jews were booted out by the Romans. Never. Never, never a Palestinian state. There was not even such a thing as a, as a Palestinian people. But in the late 1880s, as the land began to prosper, there were many peasant migrant farm workers in the surrounding Arab countries. Hey, they heard you can get work in Palestine. So they migrated to Palestine, as it was called, to get work for economic, from, reason. for economic reasons from the Jewish people who were reclaiming the land and made it prosper. Now, most of the modern quote-unquote Palestinians are the descendants of these people who came late along after the Jewish people had begun to make the land prosper. Uh, most of the land didn't belong to anybody. It was just part of a no-man's land that had sat there for centuries. And when the British overthrew the Turks in 1917, you had this land that's sitting there that's somewhat uh, prospering by now a bit. Uh, some of it belonged to rich, absentee Arab landowners that lived in Damascus or, or Cairo or Baghdad. They sold it at premium prices desert uninhabitable mm -hmm. land at premium right. prices. <laughs> the Jewish people bought most of the land. Others, there was just no claim for anybody because it just sat there for centuries. Uh, to be fair, yes, there, there's some parcels of this land that Arab people lived on, but there's no way to know who owned it. And many of the Arab people lived on land that was owned again by these absentee Arab land owners that was bought by the Jewish people and you have an Arab person who's been living there for 50 years or so, he, he thinks it's his. Like but he, right. he was just a sharecropper, basically. Right. Uh, anytime you have a war and you have massive movements of people, you're going to have injustice. That's right. But overall, the great majority of Arabs who lived in the land fled the land uh, without ever seeing an Israeli soldier they, the Jewish Correct. people so the did, Jewish not people did not push them off push the land, them off the land at all. And that is as clear as one can hear it. That's the way it was. We're going to cut away here, and thank you for sharing that, Dr. Booker. We're going to cut away here to a really interesting event that took place in Houston recently, and it was an Israel Solidarity Rally, rally where many uh, Christians and churches came out, Jewish people came out, and to support Israel, and it really brought the relationship between the two houses to a new level. And we just want you to watch us.
I think the Christians supporting Israel are fabulous. They're showing their human side. I think the issue of supporting Israel is above politics. It has to do with humanity. And I know that your religion is calling for uh, love thy neighbor. And uh, you're just doing what it says in your book. And uh, we really appreciate, we need your support, and we're lucky that you're here. Thank you. It's important for Christians to support Israel because God chose the Jewish people and he gave them the land of Israel. In this prophetic season, he's returned them to that land and all of our destinies in God are tied up there. And part of his purpose for the church is that we be a blessing to Israel during this time and be a light to them and stand with them in their difficulties as they undergo the, the persecutions and things they're undergoing because God's plan is going to be fulfilled when we all become one. And when and God brings us all together in Him. So because of the prophetic season, it's important for the church to support Israel. Not just the Christians support Israelis. I think American uh, in large uh, supports Israel. We, uh, we feel that America has a mission to fight terrorism uh, worldwide. Israel is uh, part of uh, the powers that is trying to uh, fight terrorism for a long time. I think that this is not one uh, religion's conflict, but I mean, it's everyone's conflict, so we should stop terrorism everywhere. And God bless President Bush and, and Prime Minister Sharon. And God bless America and Israel. We cannot do anything else but support the nation of Israel because if God is for them then who can be against them? It's Leah, I'm the, a survivor of the Holocaust and for Christians to support Israel is just the best, the most wonderful thing that has ever happened in my life because it was uh, because of bigotry against the Jews by Christians during World War II that all of the Holocaust happened. So I hope this, this is what is going to help us. And there'll be many more pro-Israel rallies coming to areas all around the country. So you contact us on the crossover and we'll get the information to you. Dr. Booker, the last three minutes, all this talk, all this battle over Jerusalem, does Jerusalem itself have a voice in this whole matter? Jerusalem is the heart of the battle. And here we see conflicting claims for Jerusalem Jewish people claiming it's their ancient capital, the Islamic people claiming it's their ancient capital. But what are the facts of the voices say? Exactly. To the Jewish people, you find in the Holy Bible, in both Testaments, the word Jerusalem is mentioned over 800 times. That tells us how important it is to the Jewish people. Wow. And secondarily to the Christians. But when we open up the Koran, it's amazing the word Jerusalem is not found even one time in the Quran, 800 to zero. So how can they, why would this be a holy city? What, what is? It was, never, it it was never really a holy city to the Palestinian people and the Arab people until the Jewish people liberated it in 1967. All of a sudden then it became the third holiest site to Islam. 
So underneath what? Medina, Mecca. Mecca is, is the holy site? Mecca is the first holy site. Medina is the second holy site. Uh, during the time of Mohammed, Jerusalem was outside of the influence of Islam. Uh, he never even went to Jerusalem, although there's uh, traditions that he did in Islamic folklore. Uh, the mosques that are built on Jerusalem, uh, on the Temple Mount, mm -hmm. were built uh, many decades after Mohammed had died. So, you know, it, it could not have been sacred to him. But uh, Once it was under Jewish occupation. It was under Jewish occupation, and all of a sudden it became sacred. Okay. Dr. Booker, um, in the last minute, why don't you take us through America's self-interest again here in regards to Zechariah. So here's a Jewish prophet God spoke to, and it seems to be applicable today. There's a Jewish prophet centuries ago that said one day Jerusalem would be a heavy stone burdening all the nations, and any nation that tried to remove that stone from the hands of the Jewish people would come under the judgment of God. And so for all of you who are watching today, our own self-interest, our destiny is connected to the Jewish people and the state of Israel. We must stand firm for a secure, strong Israel with Jerusalem as its eternal, undivided capital. We owe it to ourselves. Dr. Booker, thank you so much for coming to our program again and sharing your voice with our viewers. Thank you. It was a pleasure. We hope you enjoyed the show. Shalom and God bless. Yes, let them rejoice with glad as well. In your courts, O Lord, let to flourish like the trees of Lebanon.